Welcome to lecture four, in which we're going to talk about free fall and gravity mostly on Earth. Now, this is the first lecture where we actually talk about something that doesn't just follow from the math. So, so far, everything we've done just followed from the definitions. Like, we defined velocity as change in position. We defined acceleration as change in velocity. And the sort of results that gave that that we got from that were just derived from the math there was nothing about nature that could have said velocity is not the rate of change of position with time that was definition there's no universe where that's not true where that might work differently it's a mathematical fact so now free fall is this one sort of area where actually we have to go out or somebody had to go out and do some experiments to actually figure out how stuff works and after this we're going to go back to doing some more math stuff um, but we're going to be starting to do more physics as it were actually study how nature works in the near future but right now this is our first exposure and the particular detail that we, in a sense, have to discover by experiment, that people did discover by experiment, it wasn't just math, is how, um, how does gravity work? In this case, just how does it work on Earth? We'll talk about the general theory of gravity uh, much later in the course. So we're going to discuss what is free fall, what is the nature of gravity, um, and we'll talk a little about just little bit bits of history of how it all came about, but we're going to do some sample calculations so let's get started with those so here yeah, let's ask the first question what is free fall um, it's just a term and in physics we mean it's when something is accelerating exclusively due to gravity right so if i drop a rock here's me um, with my new haircut i've got a rock i'm about to drop it right so i drop the rock as soon as i take my hand away the rock will be falling, it will be going downwards due to gravity, um, and this is called free fall. Now, we'll be able to talk about this in a, with a lot more um, precision once we've talked about forces, but you can imagine if I say I drop a piece of paper instead, the piece of paper won't just fall, it'll sort of gently um, sort of glide down. That's because this air resistance there, and so the, the paper, a piece of paper, would not be in free fall because, in addition to gravity, there'd be air resistance acting on it. Now, it's also true for the rock, but for the case of the rock, the air resistance is very, very small compared to, the, to, to its weight. That's the force of gravity. Um, and... So we can ignore it. We can ignore the air resistance, at least while the rock is, is not going too fast. Right? Once, if you drop the rock from space, eventually it'll go so fast that um, falling through the atmosphere, that air resistance cannot be ignored. But in many cases, it's a fairly good approximation um, to ignore air resistance. That said, the fact that there is air all around us, and it's really hard to get something to actually freely fall perfectly freely without... Um, any air resistance interfering, it was sort of a hindrance, or in history, I suppose, for people to actually understand how gravity works. Let's have a look what happens. So I drop this, and does the object fall with a constant velocity, or no? Right? If you, if you, if you say you do this, and you can do this at home, you just drop an object, and you t um, film it with your camera, you can just take a um, phone or some you know, cheap digital camera, and then you watch the video slowly, you can see, maybe even frame by frame, um, that the, the rock would be accelerating. So, rock will fall. This kind of observed fact. Rock falls with a constant acceleration. Not constant velocity, otherwise everything would be falling at the same speed. Um, but everything falls with the same acceleration. That is not obvious. It's maybe not even intuitive. But it is an observed fact. 
course here this is all assuming we ignore air resistance which we can do for the rock air resistance as i said cannot be ignored with very light um, object light but large objects like a piece of paper or a feather or so um, although i'm gonna give you the link to a fun video where they have a giant vacuum chamber and look at a bowling ball and a feather falling at the same time so what does the rock look like as it falls now if you actually do this you take a video and as i said you can do this um what you're going to get is is something like this actually what am i drawing here um let's say this is my starting point here so this is my how should i do this um this is my starting point this is my rock now after a little bit it's going to be here then here then here, then here, and maybe there's the ground. That's my motion diagram might look something like this. Clearly accelerated motion. Every maybe tenth of a second, say this is this is zero seconds, point one, point two, point three, point four. Um, every tenth of a second it covers more distance than it did in the previous tenth. So let me put down a coordinate system so we can describe this motion. I'm gonna start put my origin up here. I'm going to have it point down just because I feel like it. I don't have to do that, but I'm going to. What I would find is that the velocity against time graph, now it's going to be positive because it's moving downwards and my coordinate system points downwards, hence velocities are going to be positive. Same direction. The graph is going to look something like this. So you can't do, get the data, you can do this. So I said if you could have spare time, you're going to get a graph that looks approximately like this. Now you do this and the slope you're going to get is approximately 9.8 meters per second squared. That's just an experimentally established thing, right? You do this experiment, the high accuracy, you know, careful setup, you're going to get this. Now what's interesting is you get this, never mind how big the rock is, Never mind what the rock is made of, what type of rock it is, or is it a metal ball or something else. It it doesn't it doesn't matter. So this is 9.8. We're going to give this a name. This is the acceleration due to gravity on Earth. Acceleration due to gravity on Earth. When you give this a symbol lowercase g, and that's equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. Right? If you lived on a different planet, it would be a different value. We're going to figure out later how that value comes about, how we can calculate it if you know how big the planet is and how much mass the planet has. But right now, while we're stuck on Earth, this is the value. Right? Applies to all objects. Um, and no matter what they're made of, no matter how big they are, always assuming though there's no nothing else, no other force acting. We talk about forces more down the line, but it's impossible not to not to at least mention them somewhere along the way. Um, so air resistance would be another force. If the object is experiencing significant air resistance, then it's not in free fall, then it will not have that acceleration. And as you can tell from the units, this is a value of acceleration. Now, interestingly, for the longest time, people didn't understand this. So if you go back, uh, let's do a tiny bit of history. So Aristotle, and that was um, in the fourth century um, BC, um, he was, you know, one of the great um, Greek Greek philosophers, natural scientists. So they weren't really doing science in the same way that we think of it in terms of very controlled experiments. A lot it was very intertwined with philosophy, perhaps too much so. He was also famously one of the tutors of um, Alexander the Great when he was a teenager. When Alexander was a teenager. Um, so he lived around then, 
And his, his theory was, his hypothesis was that the velocity of falling, um, or speed of falling, is proportional to the mass. That is total nonsense, right? This is this is nonsense. But it seemed in a way intuitive um, to people, I suppose. And if you you know you go out in the street, you ask someone who's taking hasn't taken a physics class, they might be like, yeah, it sounds reasonable. If it's heavier, it falls faster. No, 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 no. There's a lot wrong with this. For one, things don't fall with a given speed; they fall with an acceleration. So the speed keeps changing. Two, it doesn't depend on the mass. The only re reason you might think it depends on the mass is because of air resistance because if the same air resistance acts on two objects it will have a greater effect on the one with the lower mass and we'll talk about that more in more detail down the line but this idea lasted for i, I suppose 2000 years people were not questioning this too much at least not that we have records of them questioning it and then famously um, galileo in pisa he dropped from the Leaning Tower of Pisa, he dropped um, some weights and showed at different weights they um, they fell at the same at the same rate. So this was around 1590, I think. The the, the Pisa experiment, and that essentially showed that different objects um, take the same time to reach a bottom, no matter how big or small they are. He had two objects that were, you know, or had both had negligible, negligible air resistance. Um, so interestingly, there was a similar experiment done earlier um, in Delft by by a physicist, mathematician, um, Steven and De Groot. Now I'm not, I don't speak Dutch, so I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right. De Groot, um, something like that. That I think it was around 1586, I want to say, so a couple of years before Galileo, but that one is the, the more, uh, more famous one. Um, it was in Delft, and they dropped two um, two lead balls of different sizes and said, um, and showed that they, they were falling at the same at the same rate by essentially finding the time for them to hit the ground turned out to be the same. Um, two lead balls of different sizes. And I encourage you to look up these experiments, just read about them, you know, go online, find some resources, just read around a bit what we're, what we're learning. Um, and they famously said, look, Aristotle was wrong. They explicitly stated that. Of Aristotle. Wrong. And then they'll talk about another hundred years before and the sort of full theory of mechanics was developed, maybe slightly less, um, by Isaac Newton's, but these were uh, I guess the, the trailblazers of of the sort of modern mechanics to a great extent. Um, although they're not very well known and um, whereas Galileo Galileo is. So Air resistance is this kind of thing that gets in the way of doing the experiments and apparently for about 2,000 years um, stopped us from, from, from seeing that everything accelerates at the same rate. Why is that? How can it be? How can gravity work that way? That are, those are very deep questions that we're going to partially answer in this class. We're going to give a... Um, now we're going to develop a full theory of gravity, namely Newton's theory of gravity, but in a way that will just sort of post delay the question, reformulate the question, why does gravity work that way? And um, we'd have to go deeper into what's called general relativity to really understand that, but the mathematics required for that is, is quite advanced, and you might take this in a sort of last, um, in the last year of your undergrad, if you take physics or maybe maybe even during graduate studies, uh, because it is fairly difficult. Now, another interesting just example of an experiment was done by David Scott. Now, he was a NASA um, astronaut, 
um, during Apollo 19, uh, Apollo 15, um, went to the moon, dropped a, in 1971, dropped, uh, dropped a hammer and a feather. on the moon and showed that indeed they were falling at the same rate because there's no atmosphere on the moon so there's no um, there's no air resistance and I'm also going to give you the link to a little um, um, segment from a, from a BBC um, program where they have a giant vacuum chamber in which they're going to drop a bowling ball and some feathers and it's remarkable to watch the feathers not behave the way they used to um, just because we're so used to seeing them in inside the atmosphere in the context of air resistance all right so in a sense that covers it right a bit of history gravity can cause a constant acceleration um, on all objects that are freely falling so let's now just do um, some some examples with that to get get better grips of it so here's the first example we are going to drop a rock down a mine shaft and we managed to do this we can't see how deep it is it's really far down it's dark and we hear the rock hit the ground after eight seconds so how deep is the shaft well it's accelerated motion right because it's falling just under gravity just once you let you drop the rock don't throw it with force you don't push it on just let it go um, gravity will do the, work, the rest it's accelerated motion with an acceleration that's equal to g right that value 9.8 meters per second squared. so g is a specific acceleration um, namely the acceleration due to gravity which on earth happens to be 9.8 so that means we can figure out the, the distance now what variable am i going to use well imagine this is my mine shaft here right and i'm going to start up here and it's going to fall down um let me maybe use again a, i want to have a vertical coordinate system because it's moving vertically um, let me call this y just we like to use y for vertical um, directions very often it's just a convention, but you can call it whatever you like. You can call it W or Z, or that's literally use the word height as your variable or something like that, right? There's nothing wrong with picking something else. It's just a convention. And we often like to pick, pick Y for the vertical direction. So um, delta Y, the change in the, the vertical position is its accelerated motion. And we derived in the previous lecture, that's going to be equal to this plus one half a t squared now because we're just dropping it v naught is zero it's zero so this term just goes away now you might be worried why am i using t instead of delta t what happened to delta it's true i might have written delta t but if I'm just saying, well, I'm just going to start my timer right here, then the value of time is the same as delta t. So you often see it written like this. It doesn't matter as long as you know what you're doing. Right. If you understand the concept, what t represents, it represents the time from the start to, well, whenever I care about how deep it has fallen. And you're going to care about it after eight seconds. So... Now we just plug in, right? A is equal to G. G is 9.8. Now it's 9.8 downwards, but in this case, that's positive. Right? So um, in our second example, in a minute, we're going to pick a axis pointing up and then it's going to be negative. But G, the G is 9.8 meters per second squared downwards, right? That's what it is. Now, is, does it mean it's plus 9.8 or minus 9.8? Well, if my coordinate system points down, then it is plus because it's in the same direction as my, my axis points. So this is just G. 
So I'm going to get one half times g times, uh, I guess you can put, put t squared. Now t is 8 seconds. Now g, yes, it's 9.8. I'm going to be a bit lazy and I'm going to do that a lot. I'm going to say it's not 9.8, but 10 meters per second squared. Yes, I'm rounding. So if I actually did the measurement with a real mine shaft, my final answer would be a bit off if I made an approximation. But we're here to understand what's going on, how to do the calculation, not to get lost in numerical values. So we happen to be lucky enough to live on a planet where the acceleration due to gravity rounds nicely to 10. So I'm going to go with 10. Um, so we plug those in, 1 half times 10 times 8 squared. Um, you can do the math that comes to 320 meters. That's the depth of my mine shaft, just accelerate motion, but with a particular value of 9.8 or rounded to 10 downwards. So it was an easy example. Let's do a second, slightly more involved one. Here's example number two. We imagine we're standing at the edge of a cliff and we have a rock. And we're going to throw the rock straight up. What's going to happen is the rock's going to go up, it's going to come back down, fall past us, and hit the bottom of the um, cliff. We're going to imagine that the, the cliff is 25 meters tall, or more precisely, I imagine the rock starts out 25 meters above the ground. Right, because if this was 25 meters, then I'd have to add a little bit to get up to my hand. You're going to imagine distance from down here to up here is 25 meters, just to keep things simple. And so, as I said, we're throwing it upwards, but with an initial speed of 20 meters per second. So that's given as part of the, the setup. Now, the two things you want to know is how long before the rock reaches the highest point where it turns around. And how high is that above its starting point? And then part B, how long does it take for the rock to come all the way back down and hit the ground? And when it does so, what is the impact speed? So that, that's, our, um, that's our goal. So to not get confused in our calculation, we're going to set up a coordinate system. We're going to stick to it. Um, so let's go with the following. We've got different choices here. We might pick this down here as our as our origin, or maybe the rock up here. I don't know what to go with. I think I'm going to have this be my origin, and have my coordinate system point up. And as I said, that's a choice, right? I'm, I'm going to call this Y. You can always choose your coordinate system. They're sensible choices. They're not so sensible choices. The different sensible choices here, this is one of them, right? Picking y to point down or picking the origin down here, all good, all good. It'll just change what values your different um, parameters are going to take. Okay, so let's let's solve this. So the first thing we want to know is how long before the rock reaches the top. So at the top, What do we know about the top? And that, that is a little bit tricky to think about, at least the first time you think about it. Um, the ball goes out of it, the rock goes up, 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 and then at the top, before it comes back down, it it has zero velocity. Right, like this V at the top is equal to zero. Now, if that doesn't make sense to you, think of it this way. The rock's flying upwards, it has a positive velocity. Right. Then acceleration pulls it down, so its velocity upwards becomes smaller. So it's a negative acceleration, it's in the opposite direction of the positive velocity. And the acceleration is negative, it makes the velocity smaller and smaller and smaller until zero, and then the velocity itself becomes negative. So if I put plot this on a graph, T against V graph, um, I might start out at 20. And then it goes down, 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 down. And the point when V is zero, that's when we are at the top. If you need some more time to process this, that's fine. Let's read the section in the textbook, which I think does a pretty 
good job of explaining this. So at the top, the velocity is zero. So, okay, well, initially my velocity was 20 meters per second. So it means my change in velocity to the top, write it like this, just, you know, I'm making up my own symbols here, delta v to the top. I, that's okay to do. I know what this means, right? It's unambiguous. That's minus 20 meters per second. From plus 20 meters per second to zero. Right, because we started out at going upwards um, 20 meters per second. That's what it told us. And upwards is my positive direction. I really got to make sure I track my signs here. So the change in velocity is negative. So I was going plus 20 and now I'm going zero. Now I know that the acceleration is the change in velocity per change in time. Now I want to find a change in time. Um, and of course, I also know the acceleration here is g. Careful. The acceleration is down. But upwards was defined as positive. I defined my coordinates in to point up. So I'm going to put minus g in here. Right, let me quickly annotate this. The minus sign is there. Because our y-axis of our coordinate system points up, right? But gravity acts downwards. Right? In the previous example of the mine shaft, I chose my axis to point down, and that meant that the acceleration was in the same direction, um, and therefore it was positive. So I always have to keep track of my signs. It's something you're going to trip up some along the way. Um, so just pay attention and it, it will make sense. Okay, so we've got this. So therefore, um, I can say delta t is delta v over um, minus g. Now g is 10. I know 9.8. I don't care. It's 10. Um, so it's minus 20 meters per second divided by minus 10 meters per second squared, which comes to plus 2 seconds. Minus cancels the minus. That's how we end up with plus 20 over 10 is 2. And meters per second over meters per second squared. It's like the meters per second cancels the meters per second, but then there's 1 over second squared left down here. Well, 1 over 1 over seconds is the same as seconds. Right? Just as if this were some variable or some numerical value. So this is my time. Maybe I should label this to the top. This two seconds. How high is that up? Well, the change in height is the initial velocity times the time change in time, which we've now figured out. So it's at the top, it's the time to the top, plus one half a delta t to the top squared. Um, let's plug in the values. It's super important to track your signs here. So this one here is plus 20 meters per second. This, of course, is two seconds. Half is a half. A is minus 10 meters per second squared. If you don't have the minus under, you're going to get the wrong answer. And then this one is again two seconds. So let's work this out. I've got 20 times 2 it's 40 meters, then there's a minus sign here, minus a half times 10 times 2 squared. So it's 5 times 4, um, it's 20 meters. So the answer is going to be 20 meters. So the top of the, the flight of the rock is 20 meters above the starting point. Okay, so you've solved part A, right? got this one and we got this one before. Let's look back at what part B was. Part B was asking us how long until the rock hits the ground and what's the impact speed there. What do we know about the ground? The ground, well we know it is 25 meters below the, the starting point. Right, that is crucial. So let's write this down, part B. 
the ground is 25 meters below the starting point, meaning below the origin. So that means the y position of the ground, what's the y value, the position of the ground, it's at minus 25 meters. It is a minus because the axis points up. So my ruler starts here and counts 1, 2, 3, 4. Well, this would be the position minus 25. So minus um, 25 meters. That is where we hit the ground. Okay, we are asked to find how long until it hits the ground. Well, so if we start, but why start, right, was the origin, which is just zero by definition, um, that means my delta y, my change in y um, to the ground is minus 25 meters from zero down to minus 25. Okay, so now we can work with this. Delta y to the ground is equal to, well, it's accelerated motion, so it's the initial velocity times the time plus one half a delta t squared, and the delta t is, of course, to the ground. I'm going to abbreviate this as 2gr. To the ground, to the ground. Uh, we have, we know this, we know this. This one is minus, minus g or minus, uh, minus 10. So we can just, so we know everything except, um, except delta t. Let's write this down. Know all quantities except delta t the ground so we can easily solve it single equation single unknown I let's just just annotate this quickly so this one is minus 25 meters again don't do struck of the signs this one here is plus 20 meters per second right the initial velocity is positive it points up same direction as the axis and this one here was minus 10 meters per second squared. So we know everything, um, but of course if you try to solve it you realize it's a quadratic. That's okay, we know how to solve quadratics. You can use the quadratic equation, or sometimes we can sort of get away by doing it by inspection or completing a square, or whatever other methods you might have, you might have learned or you might like best. Um, so let's figure this out. Let's write it as a normal quadratic, so we're going to write it as this term first, my one half um, a delta t squared to the ground plus v naught delta t to the ground minus delta y to the ground, um, of course, could, no, same thing. Um, that's equal to zero. Taking this to the other side. And I mean at this point you just you just solve it, right? There's not much else to say here. So A is minus ten, so it'd be minus five delta T squared to the ground plus twenty um, delta T to the ground. Then minus minus 25, that makes this plus 25 um, is equal to zero. I've dropped the units here. I shouldn't have done this, but you can you can work that way. If you want to be careful, you should keep the units along as a kind of safety check to make sure you're not losing any quantities. You don't make any mistakes. Um, I'm going to skip that here. So minus 520, okay, we just plug this into quadratic equation, that's one way to do it. And um, if I'm not mistaken, you're going to find that the answer is um, that the answer is going to be 5 seconds. 
we can double check this. So this is um, eg use quadratic equation, which you should know. It's one of the things you probably just want to know off the top of your head. Um, just having it as a kind of in your toolbox as a kind of tool that's up your sleeve so you don't have to think about it. And if like, oh, let's look up the quadratic equation. No, if you want to become an engineer or something like that, physicist, it just comes up so much, you just need to know it. Um, but if right now you have to look it up, that is totally okay. There are also other methods to solve it. Let's check that it's true. So 5 squared is 25 minus 5, 5 is minus 125 plus 20 times 5 plus 100 plus 25. Yes, that comes to 0. You can yourself double check that that is true. Now, if you've solved the quadratic equation, you will get two answers, right? It's a quadratic. It gives you two answers, two possible solutions. Um, but the other solution is negative. You can, should check that. Use the quadratic, the quadratic equation. There's a negative value that comes out. It makes this equation also true. Negative would imply that happened before before the start. The start was the time equal zero. It happened before the start. That doesn't make any sense, but because before the start the the rock was not in free fall. But there rock was not in free fall, it was sitting on your hand. Instead. So the equation just didn't apply. So that's why the negative answer can't be the correct solution. Now you can think about what do they have some meaning though? Like what would have been? Like is there some sense in which the negative solution to this quadratic equation has some meaning and it does it always does if there's more than one solution uh, so think about think about that one but you found the time to ground five seconds and you figured out the first two seconds that was going up it was part a so then it's going to come down for three seconds all right let's figure out how what the impact speed is that was the last thing we were being asked um, what was the impact speed the impact speed well we have an initial speed we have an acceleration we have a time of flight delta t to the ground which is five seconds so those two allow us to find the change in the velocity. So we have V impact, that's the speed it has, the velocity it has when it hits the ground, is the initial speed, is our initial velocity, plus the change in velocity. That's what change in velocity means, right? The change velocity from the start to the ground. Well, if the velocity changes by a certain amount, we add that to the initial velocity that gives us the velocity at the end. It, it has to make by definition of change of velocity. Um, so this is going to be plus 20 meters per second. And be careful with your signs here. And then this, of course, is equal to A times delta T. So this gives me plus A is minus 10 meters per second squared um, times 5 seconds so that's minus 50, that comes to minus 30 meters per second. That is sensible. The minus means it's going down. Notice I didn't put the minus in by hand, it came out of the math. That's good, it's reassuring. Because when it hits the ground, the rock is indeed going downwards. And it's going downwards with a speed of 30 meters per second. Right on at the instant of its impact, of course, then it comes to rest, but then it's no longer in free fall. Okay, so that was a fairly involved example of free fall. Maybe that's a good one to you know look through now, then close your notes and just see if you can uh, do the calculation again yourself. 
to make sure you've understood everything. Let's just finish off with one more little note. Just before we close, talk, let's talk about some other planets. So we said on Earth, the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8. And if it doesn't tell you otherwise, you can safely assume that a scenario happens on Earth, right? If I'm saying a car drives over a cliff, we're going to assume it's on Earth unless we're told otherwise. I think that's a fairly, fairly safe assumption. So on Earth, 9.8, approximate 10. On Mars, Mars is a smaller planet. It has a smaller mass and also a smaller radius, and both of which affect G and not necessarily in obvious ways. And we're going to come to that near the end of the course. Um, but everything said and done, you'll find that it's about 3.7 meters per second squared, which is a little bit more, so it's a bit, just a little bit more than one third of Earth's gravity. It's a lot weaker, right? So, so things feel lighter, you can throw things higher than you can on the Earth. On the Moon, it's even lighter, it's 1.7. The Moon is very small compared to the Earth, but also small compared to Mars, um, to Mars. And it's about one sixth of the Earth. So when um, when they dropped the hammer and the feather during the Apollo 15 mission, it wasn't just that they didn't have air resistance, they also had an easier time watching it because the whole thing happened slower. Um, Jupiter, on the other hand, if you go to the surface of Jupiter, the surface is a bit fuzzy because it's a gas planet, but it still have a more or less well-defined surface. The acceleration due to gravity there is about 25 meters per second squared. Um, so about 2.5 times Earth's gravity, so it's extremely strong, probably a very unpleasant place to be um, for a significant amount of time. Okay, so one little thing we can do, for example, then is um, to calculate how long does it take take for something to fall On, on the moon as compared to Earth. Now, I don't put any numbers here to fall how far. Of course, that will determine the actual numerical value. How many meters is it falling? Um, but here's what I mean. So the change in height, right, is going to be one half g times the time Time squared. It's accelerated motion. Now, g on the moon is one sixth of g on Earth, approximate. So I'm just going to go with this. So, how long does something take to fall? Right, t. Well, in general, we're going to have just rearranging this. The t equals. Let's take the two over there. The g over there. Two delta y over g, this thing is squared, so we've got to take the square root. So I'm just rearranging this for t. So on Earth, well, I would plug in Earth. Whereas if I want to find a time on the moon for something dropping from the same height, I don't care what the height is, but I assume it's the same able to make a comparison, it would be di this. Now, g moon is one-sixth of g earth, so this one here I could actually rewrite as um, t moon is equal to the square root of 2 delta y divided by one-sixth g earth. Right, I'm just plugging in this for to here. So I can then just algebraically manipulate it. It's one over one sixth. That's just six. So let me write this out. Six times two delta y divided by g earth. And I can take the six outside. And then I can write this as square root of six times. 2 delta y divided by g earth. And this, of course, we recognize as just being the time on earth. 
So what it shows me is that on the moon, whatever I'm dropping from whatever height, well, it takes square root of 6 times as long as it would on Earth, where the time is given by this. So drop two objects from the same height, 1 meter, 10 meters, doesn't matter, just make sure it's the same on the moon and on the Earth. Well, on the moon, it's going to take square root of 6 times longer. Square root of 6 is roughly 2.4. Gravity being one sixth, the strength means things take square root of six times as long to fall. There's a little bit of um, proportional reasoning here, right? We didn't have to plug in any specific value, we were just able to compare it um, with this sort of manipulation of identifying this as the time on Earth. That's enough. Um, free fall. Hope you enjoyed it. Now get practicing. Even if you understood every single word that I said just now, you'll have to practice in order to actually master it. So get practicing, and I'll see you in the next video.